Okay, well, what we're gonna do to start the day off is a brief review of the sorts of things we did yesterday. The cool thing is no matter how old you are, if you don't have fairly significant dementia, you can grow new synaptic connections. The bad news, when you are 25, do this. There you go. When you are 70, do this. Keep, keep going, you're getting there. It literally increases, you have to increase intensity and frequency to get new synaptic connections to form and hold as we age. Chemically, it is much harder for your brain to form new synapses with increasing age. The chemistry just doesn't support it. The more excited and interested you are and the more you rehearse something, the quicker the connection will form. But if you let it go too quickly, it will be gone. And when you hear me speak again, you go, did she say that last time? I swear I don't remember that. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Because you put it in a storage area, but you didn't really access and use it regularly. And so the more you use what we talk about, that's why yesterday was awareness. Now, it felt like knowledge for many of you, but it will run out, and it'll be all gone if you're not careful. So what we're going to do is manipulate it a little bit so you'll be able to access it again and again and again. That's what this is all about. Because it doesn't do us any good if you get it in, you lose it. But here's my ultimate. I don't care what you learn if you don't do something different. Because the reason I'm in this is not because of you, as much as I like you. I mean, I do. I like you a lot, but I'm not in it for you. I'm in it for people who have dementia. And because people have dementia and they're doing the best they can, I want us to do the best we can. And that means we have to be, learn, move beyond what we know to what we do. And we have to make it a new habit. So we're not even doing the old thing. We don't even think about the old thing anymore. We just do it the new way because it absolutely is just what we do. But there's a lot of work to get there. And that's what people keep forgetting. You have to do it over and over and get feedback on how you're doing. So the first thing we're gonna do is review your brain. And what we're looking at is how well your brain's burning fuel. And put your hand way high in the air. Burning red equals full out 100%. Yellow, mid-range. Down here, where we have the light blue, Burner's on, but you haven't applied any gas. And the dark blue, purple, zero burn, because there are no brain cells in those areas. Okay. Now, at the top of each picture, put your hand right here, we're looking at the front of the brain. And the person is lying like this, so on this side is the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and at the bottom is the back of the brain. Okay. So what we're going to do is talk about first the middle of the brain. So I want you to do this. <laughs> Center of the brain. First part to develop called the limbic system. The thrive to survive. So I want you around your table to go around your table and identify some things that are happening when you have the thrive to survive. What does the basic thrive to survive involve? Talk around your table for a second. What does it involve? What helps you survive? Think about what helps you survive. Okay, I'm going to come around. What's one thing y'all said? Okay, I'm going to have you be more basic than that. Get your hand out. Get your hand out. This is what human beings need. Yeah, you got to breathe. You got to exchange oxygen. You got to get oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Absolutely. Respiration and how fast you respirate and how deep and well you respirate. Okay, that's one. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you five basic physical needs. Five basic physical needs. Do this one, thumbs up, and do this. Hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst. It's part of that core. There is a basic human need. If you're going to survive, you got to eat and drink, right? It's just a rule. Now, second one. Rum, crash. Do that with your finger. Rum, crash. Second one. Wake, rest. So wake, sleep, but it's also high energy, low energy. You all know circadian rhythm. In order to survive, you've got to establish a circadian rhythm so that you have that rhythm of wake, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, sleep. Because you've got to recharge your batteries before you can use the battery charge. 
If you wear it all the way down and you don't have a way to recharge it, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I don't. Late in the disease, what do you see? Afternoon when I'm lost and confused, I can't settle myself back down. <laughs> ah, lack of ability to regulate. So you got to regulate that. That's in that core. Babies who are chronically unable to do that, what happens? What happens to their parents? <laughs> you need to sleep! <laughs> oh, that'll help. <laughs> okay, let's go to the third one. Hold it up all by itself. I always pick an ugly one. Now drop it down and dingle it around. <laughs> Elimination. In order, in order to survive, you've got to eliminate waste product once you form it. So what is it going to involve in human beings? Pooping and peeing. You've got to eliminate what you don't need anymore. So putting it out when you don't need it anymore. It's a, you've got to do it or you're not going to survive. You've got to get rid of it. You can't keep the urine in there. It's got to come out. Okay. The next one. Now, I do this because I want you to sort of think about this. This was the most challenging one. Close your hand into a fist. Now take your index finger and notice how, without any work at all, you can make it totally line up with the rest of your hand. You see how you can line it up with the long bones in, in, the, in your hand? Try to do that with your ring finger. Don't, don't do it. Keep it closed up tight and try to make it go up real straight by itself. Can you get it? No. Can you push it up there? Does that feel good? No. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> uncomfortable. In order to survive, you've got to be comfortable. You've got to be comfortable. So now, of all of them, though, this is the most individual because each of us is designed in such a way as in order to be comfortable, we have to have sort of several things met. One is temperature. Because if it's too hot or too cold, you can't survive. So you've got to find that place where you're feeling comfortable. Another one, textures. Things pokey, things that don't, wool. Some people can't wear wool. Some people can't wear things that are, that are too slick. They don't like, and other people are like, well, I don't see what's wrong with it. It feels fine to me. So it's textures against your skin. It's movement of air. It's move real close to the person next to you. Just move up real close. Move up real close to them. <laughs> How many are going, okay, that's way too close. <laughs> so distance, how close other people are to you, how much space you need to feel comfortable. comfortable. And you want to feel comfortable. Have you ever had a child that you're trying to comfort and you're like trying to do that and they're just like, yeah, yeah. yeah, because what you're trying to do is it meeting their need and they're not relaxing, they're not getting comfortable and they can't survive that. You will wear each other out. Okay, here's another one. Comfortable. Sound, type of sound, intensity of sound, what it is, whether it's familiar or unfamiliar. Ah! Or, ah, keep a sit down. Ah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And what you don't realize is that annoys not only uh, you, it actually bothers all the other residents except for the one who's getting up, who's totally ignoring it. <laughs> because they're getting up for another reason. They were not. Comfortable, and the uncomfortableness of what they were feeling was much more intense than the uncomfortableness of the sound. They don't even care about the damn sound. They just <laughs> want to get comfortable. Okay? It's also what you see, intensity of lighting. Comfort with what visual regard is out there. Is that a thing that looks good and familiar? Is that a thing that's really sort of scary? I mean, if you see something that seems scary and you don't recognize it, you can't get comfortable. If you're not comfortable, you're not going, no, I can't do this. I need to get out of here. And it's all about visual regard and comfort. So comfort comes in many, many different things. If people are watching you, turn and look at the person. Just look at them. Look at the person and then not shake your head and go. <laughs> are you feeling real comfortable? <laughs> you're sort of going, what's wrong with me? What, what, are, you, what are you clicking for? 
So of all of them, and babies will feel, children feel this a lot. You can watch children because they're more wide open because they don't have the cover on them. But when people have dementia, I would encourage you to think about, look carefully, listen carefully, pay attention to all the cues they're giving you because they're trying to communicate with you that they're not, and if they're not comfortable, this is not going to go well. And we keep ignoring that and wanting them to be okay with what's not okay for them because it's not a like or a dislike. It's actually a survival skill. What they're trying to say is, I can't live like this. I can't survive like this. I am so uncomfortable that I can't do this. You guys are making me nuts. And what we tell them to do, turn to your partner. Now, this is my favorite. <laughs> Smile kindly. Lean in. It's real important you do all these things. And now take your sweet little hand out and go, calm down, sweetheart, calm down. <laughs> and now if they didn't like that, stroke their hair a little bit. It's okay. Pat around their face and hair. Oh, honey, it's okay. Relax. Calm down. I'm right here. I'm right here. I'll help. It's all right, sweetheart. Oh, you. yeah, it's okay. Don't get upset. Don't get upset, sweetheart. I'm right here. Sweetheart, here. Oh, let's change your shirt. You'll feel so much better. <laughs> and if you think I'm making this up, go and watch interactions. And what we do is we just, we sense it, but we don't realize what we're doing. Is it helping? No, because what did we do? Touch, we touched right away in our effort to help, but we picked a touch that's not a comfortable touch for anybody. Pat on the person next to you, pat on them. Even dogs don't like to be patted. Dogs would prefer to be stroked if you're going to do something. But they don't like when you stroke right around their face right away. Try that with a dog. They go, Until they know you and said it's okay, they don't like you stroking right around their head. Gee, imagine that. And yet, look what we do with people with dementia all the time without thinking. Okay, now the last one. Of all the basic needs, this is the one we miss the most. And I put it over on the little finger because it's a strong, strong factor in the Thrive to Survive. Stick it up all by itself. And now take it and go, ow, ow, ow. Go ahead and do that. Stick it out. Go, ow, ow. What is it? Pain. I'm hurting. I hurt. And when you hurt, what do you have to have to survive? Relief of pain. You can't have pain and survive. It wears you out. It will actually kill you. It will give you no, I can't do this anymore. How many people have heard when you're in infinite pain, when you watch people who have bone pain, metastatic pain, metastatic pain because of cancer, ow, I can't do this, I just can't do this. Emotional pain. And it's not all physical pain, it's emotional pain, it's spiritual pain. Anytime someone feels unremitting pain, they can't survive. They just can't. So let's go through those again and hopefully understand once again, I'm trying to give you an experiential way of finding this information when you need it without having to go to a note. So let's see if you can remember all of those five basic things that help you survive, give you a thrive to survive. So the first one, you have to meet the need of <laughs> hunger and thirst. Okay. The second one, wake, sleep. The rhythm of resting and then coming up with energy, so that rhythm. And, and notice what I'm doing. You want to create a wave-like motion, not... <laughs> <laughs> so one person, close your eyes and sort of relax in your chair. Take your turn with your partner. Everybody should have a partner by now. Okay, so the person with their eyes closed and relaxed, relax back in the chair. Caregivers. You pe demented people, keep your eyes closed, you're relaxing. <laughs> Caregivers? Wake up! <laughs> You knew we were going to do something. 
right? We want this. So let me show you how you do that. Tell me first name again because I can't remember. Sharon. Sharon. Okay. Six feet out. Your eyes are closed. You're asleep. I quit moving at the edge of her public space. Right here. Public. Now, if her eyes were open, she would see me. Obviously, what? Duh. She's not processing data. I'll give her a shot at it. Because she would like to hear me before she feels a touch. <coughs> Sharon. Nothing happened. Hmm. Okay, she still doesn't know I'm here. I'm not going to go, Sharon! Sharon! Because that's the same thing as having an alarm clock that goes, ah! I don't want you waking up that way because I know I'm going to over arouse you, which is going to result not in your limbic waking up, but in your autonomic, automatic amygdala going into hyperdrive. And I don't want that because that's fright, flight, fight. I know that. So what I'm going to do, Sharon, Sharon, hey, good morning. Now, what I did, I got down to the side, and if you noticed, I'm at six feet. You may not, put your arm out. Each arm is about 36 inches long. So when I add it together, I'm right at the boundary of her personal space, which is where she's looking for me to start talking to her. So I get down to the side so I'm not threatening. She's in a position where I'm not over top of her. I've got some distance from her. I take my near arm, the arm that is nearest her, and I reach out. I say her name, Sharon. And then I lay my hand, flat open fingers, no tips, flat. Lay it over the joint of the knee. The joint, which is proprioceptive. I apply a little pressure. My face is ready for the greet. What I've done with my arm is create a boundary, a barrier that says, I'm not coming in, it's yours. I'm at that distance, and when her eyes open, my other hand is ready. Hey. And now she connects. Check. She's awake. Because what we want is slow arousal, not overdoing it. And guess what we tend to do because we're trying to get her done? We get in there, we want to wake them up. Unfortunately, we overdo it and then we pay a price, and so do they because they're over aroused and they can't settle back down. Okay. Somebody had a question. Yes. What do you do with, uh, with the hearing impaired? Ah, really important. So with Kelly, I know, for instance, Kelly doesn't hear me. I want to... <coughs> morning. Now, if her, she was asleep, will she have any awareness of me until I make contact? No. no. So here's what I want you to do. Do this. Y'all must have to be standing up to do it because when you're lying down, stand up and take your fingers down as far as they'll go. What don't your fingertips touch? Your, when, knees. your knees. What does that mean it's beyond? What's it beyond? Your intimate space. It's beyond the intimate space. So what I'm picking is a place that is not within your intimate zone. And that means you're less distressed when I touch you there than you would be if I touch you within this space. Because within this space, your brain, if it's asleep and somebody touches you there, goes, oh, shit, they're close enough to kill me. <laughs> and if you're in a situation where you don't feel comfortable to start with when you went to sleep and you wake up and you don't realize who that person is, do you think you're going to stop and think about what you do? What have we just activated with that touch in the intimate space? The autonomic automatic reflex, which is flight, fight, fright. <gasps> Well, then, the next room down, I'm here to help you. <laughs> I don't think so. It didn't work out well for the last one. <laughs> OK, so if somebody is hard of hearing, this one is basically knocked out. So what do we have to be incredibly careful about where we touch? 
because they don't have a lot of warning systems heading in. Now, if somebody has glaucoma or ma actually worse, macular degeneration, they're robbed of their center field and they have dementia and they're hard of hearing. The only system we have to make the initial connection is touch. But you must touch beyond the intimate space if you want to reduce that autonomic. And you have to do deep proprioceptive touch. Now, people, will tr people tend to not do that. Reach out to the person next to you with their eyes closed. And what I want you to do is um, I want you to lightly touch. I want you to do moving touch on them. Just do moving touch and no, just lightly move your fingers on them. Like do a little quick rub or a li that little thing people like to do. Morning, good morning, how are you? How many of you are getting a reaction that's like, would you, oh my God, what are you doing? Now take that same thing you were doing and instead flat open hand pressure. Morning. And if you're going to do anything, it's a deep rub. It's a deep pressure, not a light. Use the palm of your hand, not the light. If you're going to stroke, take one hand and stabilize at the shoulder so they know where you are, and then take the other hand and rub back and forth. Not the fingers. It's always an open, flat palm. It's, it's an open, flat. I know she can't do that. Now, after I've done that, if they're starting to rouse, now take the flats of your fingers, but do your fingers and do quick, small circles. But make sure you have that hand on the shoulder when you're doing it so you know where you are. But what you're going to find is those quick, small circles, and they're still heavy. They are not light. They are heavier. They will bring somebody up but not in that hyped up way that we do. Good morning, good morning. Does that help? Tone of voice is important. Tone of voice is incredibly important. Yesterday we talked about a little bit about older adults and hearing loss. They lose high pitched, but they keep deep. One of the things that happens when we get anxious we tend to go up in the upper register because our vocal folds get a little tight, we get a little nervous, and then when we bend over, we make it worse. <laughs> so one of the rules is you always stay upright and you go down by sitting or kneeling. You don't lean in because when you lean in, you stretch the vocal folds. And that puts you in a higher register. It also reminds you of talking to children. And you tend to get up in that upper thing. And you pause and you make it sound like, Sandy. <laughs> How are we today? And the person with dementia is not stupid. And they'll go, I am not a child. I wish you'd quit talking to me like that. Because they pick up on that tone of voice that we get that comes automatically out of our mouth when we, when we are bending over like you're talking to a child. Which is very different than if you sit down. Good morning. Pause. Deeper voice, calmer, slower. Give them a chance. Well, hey, good morning. How are we today? You doing okay? It's so good to see you. Sandy, you look good. How have you been? Oh, here, let me get your shirt for you. Rush, 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 rush. Okay, so what's our third one? Our third thrive to survive? Elimination. Oh, the baby's coming. Oh, my God, the baby's coming. My water just broke. The number of times I've heard people, Tipa, how old are you? Does it really matter? <laughs> Y'all act like if I find out I'm 85, I will realize I'm not having a child. Well, what I'm doing is, is identifying the sensation I'm feeling. And the emotional memory that I have of that kind of sensation is childbirth. What I don't realize is I just peed and I need to go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement. That's what I don't realize. What I am I'm realizing is it's really uncomfortable and it's hurting and I don't like it and I want this to quit. And I'm trying to tell you of the intensity of my what? I have moved beyond uncomfortable. Now I'm in pain. And because I don't like pain, I'm going to hold that stuff up in, which means I have a high risk of becoming impacted, particularly if I'm not moving and drinking. Yeah. Yeah, 
and you've given me drugs for pain. <laughs> which stopped me from moving. I mean, the whole thing becomes a cycle. And then when I'm, ow, oh, ow, oh, she needs something for anxiety. <laughs> and so the cycle progresses, okay? So what's our fourth one? Comfortable. And this is the hardest one to figure out for another human being. What makes it a little easier? Knowing what they liked before and what they did not like before. So I want you to identify, go to your five senses or yourself on a slip of paper, these five senses, which, what are they? What you see, what you hear, what you feel and do, feel and do combo, what you smell and what you taste. I want you to have love, hate. Love these, hate these. Got it? For each of those sensations. What are some things you love visually? What do you love visually? Maybe your favorite color. Maybe uh, wh where you like, what you like to see. Uh, maybe who you like to see. Maybe how close you like stuff. Maybe what do you like to see visually? What is a ah, yeah, visually that draws you? It will always draw you. You know it. Glass of wine, <laughs> cup of coffee, I mean, Coors Light. What's it, what is going to draw you? What will make you go, yeah? People, things, stuff in the environment, places, whatever visual, amount of light. The second one, things you hear, favorite sounds, favorite, favorite music, favorite... Um, favorite things and things you absolutely despise, you hate it. It drive if when you hear it, it will absolutely drive you crazy. You can't stand it. It will make you want to either tell that to, that's enough, tell them to shut up, or you'll want to leave, or you'll go to sleep because you just can't take it. And then I want you to think of things that you like to feel. It, you love to feel it or do it. So it's you doing it, not somebody doing it to you. What are things you love to do? What do you like to feel? And what do you hate having to touch? What just, mm. And for me, raw oysters would be on that list. I don't want any of that crap in my mouth. I do not want, mm, I cannot picture anything worse than a raw oyster getting in my mouth. I just, mm, the texture of it, it is not the taste. It is simply the texture. And I, do, I wouldn't do a raw egg either. I think that's nasty. I don't know how y'all do it. Makes me want to gag right just here thinking about it. And I don't like things too tight on me. If they're too tight, they're coming off. which later in the disease might be in the main lobby at 3 in the afternoon. Okay. Now the next one, smells that you really like, smells that you love that just, oh, yeah, that is, you're going to move toward it if you smell it at all. And then think of smells that just, oh, God, no, not that. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, 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 mm. And for most of us, let me just tell you, vomit fits into that category. <laughs> Thought I'd give you an example. All I have to say the word, remember those are strong and primitive? Yeah, they're there. Yeah, oh God, no. Oh boy, no, not that one. Mm, mm, mm. And then the finally, taste. What do you love? What do you hate taste-wise? Now understand, be careful because taste is only sweet, sour, salty, bitter. So you want to describe probably things that have that primary quality. What quality don't you like very much and which do you really like a lot? Okay. Okay, did you get, your, get that down? Okay, now tear that piece of paper off. And what I want you to do is pass it two people over in the, in the circle. Okay, you can take a few more seconds to do your homework there. I know some of you are like, well, I, didn't, I, I was just thinking. I didn't write because I didn't know I was going to have to share it because you didn't believe you were going to. Oh, so excuse me, let me say that again. Oh, so you didn't actually write it down. You were just thinking? Yeah. 
because you figured it was just something you knew you needed to know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope you figure this out before you get your dementia. Because yeah. <laughs> this is not going to work if you're the only one who knows that and nobody else knows that about you and you get dementia and you can't talk anymore. Oh, man, then I better put that one under us. Uh-huh. All of a sudden, this gets a lot more important when you realize it's going to impact your care down the road. How many times do you think on your advanced directives you write down what you really like and what you don't, and yet what did I tell you all these things were part of your thrive to survive? And we miss important pieces of data because nobody tells us how important they are. Okay, so take a look at the persons that you got versus your own, and notice you may see some similarities, but you're probably going to see some significant differences. Now imagine that I'm your caregiver and I know nothing about you. And because I am aware of what makes me comfortable and uncomfortable, what is my basic guide I would use? Myself. That's what I use. I use myself to try to figure out you. Unfortunately, we tend to make assumptions. We don't assess whether we're in the right ballpark or not. We just assume that if I like something and it makes me feel good, then right off, I would assume it would probably be okay for you until you tell me, no, you know, really, that's, I don't care for that at all. Now, if you lose words and you lose the ability to communicate effectively with words, what do you think are your options? Well, let's go and review that section just so you remember. Put your hands to your temples, which is where you process what you hear. And I want you to do left, right. Do left, right. Left, right. Do it again. Left, right. Good. Now, language on the left, rhythm on the right. Okay, so let's try it again. Left, right. Left, right. Now, language on the left, rhythm on the right. And you lose on the left, retain on the right. And because... On the left, what do you do with language? Manipulate it. That's what that skill is all about. It's skill that allows you to manipulate language. What are the three skills over there? Nope. What language skills? Now, hang on. Let me give them to you because now you're working too hard. This is a word. So this is vocabulary, comprehension of speech, and speech production the actual sensory motor ability to produce speech in the format and way we mean to produce it. So the ability to articulate and say words, to get one word after the other word so it, it says what I mean it to say. So uh, the, um, the, the, in, in, in the, um, <laughs> it's the, it's the, it's the, it, it's the one that, 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 that you, 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 um, <laughs> you, 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 Peck, 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 peck it, peck, no, not peck it, not peck it. And you can actually watch people struggle to, they know, they know it and they can't find the articulation pattern that will allow them to get the word out that they're, they know it, but they can't make the articulation happen because that is a connection between the words in this section, put your hand up here with the skill up here in this section, sensory motor. And they're losing sensory motor fine motor skill set related to the wiring. And so they know it, they know it, but they can't find it. But if I say, you're looking something to, something to eat or drink? Drink. Something to drink? Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Hot or cold? Not cold. Not cold. You don't want cold. You want hot. Yeah. Come on. Let's go find you something. Okay. She can comprehend words when I give her the visual-verbal combo a lot better than if I just say words, and she has to figure out the word, comprehend the word, figure out what it means, and then give me an answer. That's actually really pretty complicated when you think about it, right? <laughs>